Good morning. Welcome to today's live webinar, More Than Words, at which the report, Vocabulary Results from the 2009-2011 NAEP Reading Assessments is being released. I'm Cornelia Orr, Executive Director of the National Assessment Governing Board and moderator for today's event. The Governing Board is an independent, bipartisan board that sets policy for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also called NAEP or the Nation's Report Card. Today you will hear results from the first ever vocabulary-focused NAEP Report Card. This report reveals the effects of students' vocabulary skills on reading comprehension. By examining the vocabulary results from the 2009 and the 2011 NAEP reading assessments, it permits us to gain new insights about the ability of students to understand and apply word meanings in the context of reading passages, going well beyond merely recalling definitions in isolation. Today you will find out about the vocabulary skills of 4th, 8th, and 12th grade students and learn about the national and state level patterns in student performance. We have a wonderful panel of experts who will share their thoughts and reactions to this unique report card today. I'll briefly introduce each of our speakers and then our webinar producer will review the meeting logistics with you. Our first speaker will be Jack Buckley, who is Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics. He will present the bulk of the report card findings. Our second speaker is Brent Houston, principal of Shawnee Middle School in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and a member of the National Assessment Governing Board. Brent will address some of the factors behind the vocabulary results, including student performance by family income, a matter close to his heart. He'll also share some of the practices he and his teachers have used over the years to encourage better vocabulary skills in students and his experiences and reflections on the importance of integrating contextualized vocabulary into the curriculum and instructional practices. Francie Alexander is the Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer of Scholastic Incorporated and a former member of the National Assessment Governing Board. She also, was also a member of the steering committee that guided the development of NAEP's new reading framework. Francie will share her thoughts on the report card results, emphasizing how critical vocabulary is to reading comprehension and what NAEP data has told us about the important construct and implications for implementing the Common Core. Finally, today we'll hear from Margaret McNaught, I'm sorry, Margaret, <laughs> a senior scientist with Learning Research Development Center and clinical professor in the Department of Instruction and Learning at the University of Pittsburgh School of Education. Not only is Margaret a recognized expert on this topic, she also was a member of the planning committee which made rec recommendations for the current NAEP reading assessment framework including the creation of vocabulary assessment. She will provide an in-depth analysis of the report's results and share some of the ways in which NAEP's assessment of vocabulary is distinct from traditional assessment. Following Margaret McCallan's remarks, we will have a brief online question and answer session with all attendees and speakers. Before we begin hearing from our speakers, uh, Gerald, our webinar producer, will address logistics for using the WebEx system. Gerald? Thank you, Cornelia. If you have any technical issues during today's webinar, please refer to your confirmation email or call 1-866-229-3239 for assistance. Our speakers will address as many questions during the Q&A session later in the event, but attendees are welcome to submit their questions about today's report card results or speakers' comments throughout the entire presentation. Simply type your question into the Q&A panel on the lower right side of your WebEx screen. Be sure to submit questions to all panelists, which can be selected from the drop-down menu in the Q&A panel. Please inc include your name and organization with all questions. Please note that live closed captioning is also available in the bottom right corner of your screen in the Media Viewer panel. Click the X in the blue bar on the top of the media viewer if you'd like to close the captioning panel. Back to you, Cornelia. Thank you, Gerald. 
It's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker. Dr. Jack Buckley is the Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics. On leave from his position as a Professor of Applied Statistics at NYU, he is well known for his research on school choice, particularly related to charter schools, and on statistical methods for public policy. Dr. Buckley served as Deputy Commissioner of NCES from 2006 to 2008, so he is now returned as the Commissioner. He spent five years in the U.S. Navy as a surface war warfare officer and nuclear reactor engineer and also worked in the intelligence community as an analytic methodologist. Jack, thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Cornelia, and good morning. So I'm here today to share with you the results from our new report, Vocabulary Results from the 2009 and 2011 Reading Assessments. This report's the first NAEP report to present vocab vocabulary results all alone. So with the new NAEP vocabulary assessment, NCES explored the relationship between students' knowledge of what words mean and reading comprehension. As we know, reading requires a fundamental knowledge of the meaning of words, so it's important to recognize how students' vocabulary con contributes to their understanding of what they read. And the NAEP vocabulary assessment does just that. It looks at how well students understand how a word's meaning affects the text they're reading. Rather than asking a student to define an isolated word, we explore whether a student can identify and use the right word meaning to shape their understanding. When a student encounters a word, they might think of several different definitions depending on their prior knowledge and experience. For instance, in the NAEP vocabulary assessment, when shown the passage, ducklings come home to Boston, students read the word puzzled. Some students might think of a jigsaw puzzle piece or crossword puzzle when they read this word. Other students might think of being confused or perplexed. But when placed into the context of the passage, only one of these word meanings fits. In this particular passage, the author used the word puzzled to convey confusion about why there were no ducks at the public garden in Boston. Now, puzzled is just one example of many words that students read as part of the NAEP vocabulary assessment. The results of this assessment let us explore how well students at grades 4, 8, and 12 were able to understand a variety of words in context. Understanding word meaning is essential to reading comprehension. No matter what students are reading, a strong sense of word meaning provides a basis for greater comprehension in an increasingly fast-paced world. We assessed vocabulary as part of the 2009 and 2011 reading assessments. In 2009, we assessed reading at all three grade levels, 4, 8, and 12. While in 2011, we assessed grades 4 and 8 only. Results from the 2009 reading assessment are based on a nationally representative sample of 116,000 fourth graders, about 103,000 eighth graders, and 45,000 12th graders. And sample numbers for the 2011 assessment were a little bit higher, about 213,000 uh, students at grade 4, almost 170,000 students at grade 8. For both assessment years, the fourth and eighth grade national samples uh, were composed of representative samples of all 50 states plus DC and the Department of Defense school system. We combined those together to create the national samples. The 12th grade sample was national only, but we also have separate state results for 11 states who volunteered to participate at grade 12 in 2009. We'll present the results today as percentages of students who correctly answered the vocabulary questions and also as scale scores on a zero to 500 point scale. So the actual vocabulary questions uh, were placed into two different types of section on the NAEP reading assessment, comprehension and vocabulary. Comprehension sections included questions about the passage as well as vocabulary questions. So students were asked to read full length passages, which range from about 800 to 1200 words in length, depending on the grade. And then the questions in these sections were either multiple choice or constructed response. The vocabulary only uh, sections featured shorter passages, about half the length of the, those in the comprehension section. And there were uh, five, approximately five vocabulary questions in each of these sections. And they were all multiple choice. So when we looked at which words to select for this assessment, they had to meet the following criteria. So first, the vocabulary words we assessed had to be characteristic of written language, not conversational or everyday speech. 
Secondly, they had to be used across several content areas rather than narrow technical terms whose use would only be confined to one area or particularly specialized language. We also picked words that had to present familiar concepts. So even if the word was not unknown or the word was not generally easily known, uh, the concepts would be uh, recognizable to all students. And they had to be necessary for understanding all or part of the passage where they occurred. Now let's turn to the results. Starting with the national results, uh, I just want to quickly point out, as always, that these scores are based on samples. So we will be testing uh, for statistically significant differences, which are uh, denoted throughout the report as well as the presentation uh, by an asterisk. And we'll use an asterisk to indicate scores that uh, over time or between student groups are statistically significantly different from one another. So we identify low, middle, and higher performing students on a zero to 500 point vocabulary scale here using percentiles. So the figure on the left shows grade four percentile vocabulary scores for the 2009 and 2011 assessments. Between 2009 and 2011, we see declines in the scores of the higher performing students, those at the top at the 75th and 90th percentiles in both the fourth and the eighth grade. The score for students at the 90th percentile fell from 269 to 266 in the two-year period, and the score for the 75th percentile fell from 247 to 245. As you can see, the remaining percentiles did not show statistically significant changes. We see similar patterns for the higher performing students in grade eight in 2009 and 2011. However, in this case, at the eighth grade, the scores of the lowest performing students, those in the 10th percentile, actually rose between 2009 and 2011. You can see on the red line on the right at the bottom. The vocabulary report also examines the connection between student vocabulary performance and reading comprehension overall. On average, students who scored higher in reading comprehension, as you'd expect, also scored higher on vocabulary questions. So for example, when we look here at the grade four results, we can divide the students into four groups based on their reading comprehension level from the main NAEP reading assessment, here just defined as lower, lower middle, upper middle, and upper. So the lower group, for example, are those who had scores on the NAEP reading assessment that place them in the lowest 25% of students, which corresponds to an average vocabulary score, in this case of 177, as measured on the vocabulary scale on the right. So as you might expect, when we move higher in reading comprehension performance, the vocabulary scores on average for students tend to increase. And if we bring in the results for both 8th and 12th grade, you can see that association across all three grades. Higher reading comprehension is correlated with higher vocabulary scores. We also look at uh, gaps as we do in all our NAEP reporting. So for example, race, ethnicity gaps and gaps by gender. Here's an example of the white-black score gap at grades 4 and 8. For vocabulary and what you see here is no significant change from 2009 to 2011. So looking at the left, the grade 4 gap of 27 points in 2009 was not significantly different from the 29 point gap in 2011 and similar results at grade 8. Turning to the white Hispanic gap, we see no significant change from 2009 to 2011 at grade four, but in grade eight, we actually see a decrease, a narrowing of the gap from statistically significant from 30 to 28 points. In this case, neither the white nor the Hispanic score changed statistically over the two assessments, but the changes together were just enough to cross the threshold and have the gap between them statistically shrink. At grade four, the score differences shown here between white and Asian Pacific Islander students were not statistically significant for either year. And at grade eight, the five point differences were significant in both years with no change from 2009 to 2011. Now, as I mentioned before, at grade 12, we only have results for 2009. Here, grade 12 white students shown by the dark gray bar on the left had a score on average of 307 higher than the scores of their black or Hispanic peers, but not significantly different from the score for Asian and Pacific Islander students. As I mentioned, we're also able to compare vocabulary scores for male and female students at all three grades. In each graph, male scores are shown by the dark gray bars on the left, while female scores are those on the right. At the fourth and eighth grade, girls had a higher average score by two or three point margin. And at 
12th grade, actually, the difference in scores was not statistically significant. Now let's turn to state results. Again, remember we have complete state results at grades four and eight, but for the 12th grade, we only have results for the 11 volunteer states at 2009. So this map compares the average vocabulary score for each state with the national average at grade four in 2011. The 20 states shown in blue had a score that was higher than the nation, while 12 had an average that was lower, here shown by the, the orange color. Actually, the uh, orange color is, should be denoting those that are not statistically different from the nation. The red color actually shows those that are lower than the nation. In grade eight, 23 states had a score that was higher than the nation, while 13 had an average that was lower. It's interesting to note that in both grades, the states with higher scores are concentrated in the north, central, and northeastern areas of the country. Grade 12 comparisons show that three states out of the 11 participating had a higher vocabulary score than the nation. These states were New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Two states, Arkansas and Florida, had an average score that was lower than the nation. Now let me turn to a few sample questions so I can better show not only the types of questions they responded to, but how well they did. So here we have the full fourth grade reading passage that I previously described, which discusses the statues in Boston's public garden portraying the ducklings made famous in the book, Make Way for Ducklings. And the statues were created in 1987, almost 50 years after the book itself was written in response to questions from two boys who, having read the book, expected to see ducklings when they went to the public garden. This is the question from the reading passage that asks students the meaning of the word puzzled in the phrase, they were puzzled, referring to those two boys. 51% of fourth graders nationally correctly recognized that the word meant that the boys were confused that there were no ducks, or here, uh, response choice D. Now, to better understand the types of words that students recognize in context, let's look at what we call an item map for fourth grade. The vocabulary words shown in the right-hand column are matched with a scale score attained by students who are likely to understand the correct meaning of the given word in the specific context on the assessment. So the average score of fourth grade students on the assessment 216, shown in red, uh, tells us, again, this is the national average for fourth graders. Students scoring at 216 were likely to grasp the meaning of the words that mapped at or below that point, 216, on the vocabulary scale, which as you can see here included suggested, staggering, created, and underestimate. The meaning of the word puzzled from the sample item I described mapped at 247 on the scale and thus was more difficult for students to identify. In fact, only those above the 75th percentile of our fourth graders were likely to answer the question correctly. More students were likely to identify the correct meaning in context for words like poses and clenched, while few students could identify the meaning in context of prestigious and barren. Let's turn now to an example at the eighth grade. Here, the students were asked to read a passage titled Mint Snowball, describing the drugstore that uh, the author's great-grandfather ran in a small town in central Illinois, and in particular, the secret mint syrup that he devised to serve with a soda fountain treat known as the mint snowball. As you can see, grade eight students were given longer reading passages than grade four students. So here's a question from the mint snowball passage. Here we ask students the meaning of the word replicate as it occurred in the phrase, thought she could replicate her great-grandfather's secret mint syrup. Here we see that 89% of eighth graders selected the correct response, B, that here replicate meant make mint syrup that tasted like his. If we turn now to the item map, you can see that replicate was at a scale score of 225. This is below the average eighth grade score of 265, shown here again in red. So recall, this means that students who scored at or above the average 265 were quite likely to understand the meaning and context of all of the words listed below, including solace, responsible, and anecdotes. And notice, again, that the three words listed at the top of the scale were quite difficult for eighth graders. And finally, here's a grade 12 reading passage, Capitalizing on the Cognitive Niche by Microsoft founder Bill Gates. 
In it, he argues that human beings evolved to fill the cognitive niche, or the evolutionary advantages accessed by intelligence in reason, advantages that Gates says can become far more powerful in the near future. And again, the length and difficulty of the passage are appropriate for the 12th grade. So one of our questions associated with this passage stated that the author states that we can mitigate the challenges of the digital age. And students were asked to identify the correct meaning of mitigate as used in this passage. 50% of 12th graders correctly chose the answer C, lessen the problems caused by technology. And if we look again at the item map, it shows us that the average vocabulary score was 296. Students scoring at 296 would have been likely to recognize the correct meaning and context of words like mitigate, as well as proactive and self-possessed. At the lower end of the scale, our 12th graders at the 10th percentile would be likely to recognize words like capitalize, prospective, and reimburse. So the report, vocabulary results from the 2009 and 2011 reading assessments, provides all of this information and much more. In addition, the initial release website gives extensive information on the performance of students and access to uh, release assessment questions through our NAEP Question Center. The NAEP Data Explorer, our online data analysis tool, also provides the opportunity for further analysis of student performance. And in conclusion, as always, I would like to offer my sincere thanks to all the many students, teachers, and schools who participated in both the 2009 in 2011 reading assessments and made this possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. I'm sure there will be some questions for you later. And uh, I would like to remind all of you who would like to submit questions to submit that to all um, panelists so that everyone can see the questions you're asking. Our next speaker, Brent Houston, is a middle school principal in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and has served Shawnee Public Schools as a teacher and administrator since 1981. As an elementary and middle school principal, Mr. Houston has coordinated and overseen numerous efforts to increase students' mastery of academic vocabulary. Mr. Houston has been a member of the National Assessment Governing Board since 2010, and currently serves on its Assessment Development Committee. Among his many honors, Mr. Houston was appointed by Governor Brad Henry in 2002 to the Oklahoma Educational Television Authority Board of Directors and was twice named Teacher of the Year. Thank you for your time today, Brent. We look forward to hearing about your school-based experiences. Thank you, Cornelia. Today's um, report puts an important spotlight on something that is not discussed nearly enough on its own, and that's vocabulary. We discuss concepts all the time, like reading comprehension and reading on grade level, but we cannot have success in those areas if our students also do not learn to understand the meaning of words in a variety of contexts. I appreciate the governing board uh, having the foresight to develop a framework requiring vocabulary results to be reported separately for this new generation of NAEP reading assessments. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a middle school principal, but um, before I was assigned to the middle school, I was an administrator at another school in our community, a pre-K through eight school. Um, and at that time, we tested using annually using the Iowa Test of Basic Skills. And consistently, each year, regardless of grade, our students scored rather low in the vocabulary subscore uh, about reading. So to attack those low scores, we developed specific lessons in language arts and reading classes that focused on vocabulary and specifically teaching multiple meanings of words to our students. For instance, in classrooms then, we would, we would hear teachers explain that the word bat, for example, uh, could be the flying mammal, could be a piece of important baseball equipment, or, or it could be something that you do with your eyelashes. But the key idea was progressing from learning words in isolation to understanding words in context. And this strategy helped raise vocabulary scores and then subsequently reading comprehension scores on the Iowa test. Now later, as an elementary school principal, I was fortunate enough to have two full-time Title I reading specialists at my disposal 
So I deployed them in a manner that allowed us to break our classes into small flex groups of four to six students. And with two reading specialists in the room, plus the classroom teacher and often a paraprofessional, we were able to dramatically reduce the pupil-student pupil ratio and focused on developing skills that we had diagnosed as needing improvement in order for students to read on grade level. This system worked tremendously for us as we were able to see growth in skills of every group of students as we tracked them from the pretest that we gave in August through the first benchmark in December and then the final post-test that was taken any time after the 32nd week of school. In addition to using the reading specialist, our school focused on developing academic vocabulary for each grade as well. Now we still focus on those strategies at Shawnee Middle School, although we do not have the personnel for small flex groups for our students. However, we do attempt to make deliberate efforts to increase students' knowledge and their mastery of words, word meanings and academic vocabulary, which involves a particular bank of words for certain subjects. For example, in mathematics, we are constantly making sure our students know the meanings of terms that they need to know to solve math problems, quotient, sum, prime number, slope, composite, and those are examples um, of words in math, for example, so that test questions or homework exercises that use these terms don't become stumbling blocks to students understanding the math concepts that we want them to understand. Today's results from the NAEP vocabulary report make it very clear that good reading performance is connected to good vocabulary skills. In 2011, fourth and eighth grade students performing above the 75th percentile in reading comprehension also had the highest average vocabulary scores. Conversely, lower performing students at or below the 25th percentile had the lowest average vocabulary score. And we see similar findings for grade 12 in 2009. But the thing that strikes me most about this report and what hits close to me uh, in my community and specifically at Shawnee Middle School is observing the performance trends by family income. As you can see about um, on the table there, that speaks to this. At my school, nearly 80% of the 816 students are eligible for free or reduced price meals. The performance gaps are significant between students who are eligible for the lunch program and students who are not. In fourth grade, for example, the gap in scores by lunch eligibility was 31 points. And in grade eight, that gap is 28 points. And those, those gaps, by the way, are similar to the white-black gap that you saw when uh, Jack made his presentation. I can look all at all this data and this report uh, anecdotally as well. Among my students who are economically disadvantaged, there are many common uh, barriers. Not having reading materials at home, not having a support group to encourage visits to the library or reading newspapers or magazines, or simply not being read to. The fact is the experience of being able to do more and to see more words and to have a print-rich environment makes a huge difference. <clears throat> Pardon me. At Shawnee Middle School, we are very aware of these disadvantages, and we try to organize lessons in reading and language arts to encourage better vocabulary skills. For example, our teachers routinely stop when they read passages aloud to ask questions and to hold conversations. This encourages students to listen for clues to define and understand words that they do not know. Also, when we have two words that sound alike but have very different meanings, um, a good example that I ran across recently was I was in a uh, history class. They were talking about the word secede, and many students were confusing that with succeed. So we isolate each word, and we pair it with a related word to help students learn the distinction between the two. So when we talk about succeed, we use words like successful and success to further highlight the difference between the two words. These NAEP results have made me realize that to improve vocabulary performance and thus overall reading performance, schools nationwide really need to go beyond teaching word definitions. I had mentioned earlier about working on academic vocabulary, which is an overall goal of my school district here in Shawnee, and that is an important skill. However, I want to explore additional strategies and spend even more time teaching contextual clues, multiple meanings, synonyms, antonyms, and so on, 
The NAEP vocabulary assessment, for example, targets words that are used across content areas. This hopefully will make us really focus on the skills that students need to increase vocabulary knowledge. Additionally, we need to look at how we teach reading. We progress, and my experience has been, we progress from decoding skills and breaking down words into pieces the first few years of elementary school, and that's reading class. But by about fourth grade, reading, reading class becomes simply a study of literature, things like plot, character development, character traits, setting, and so on. Literature is important, but it must be accompanied by instruction and skills such as vocabulary, which we should continue emphasizing throughout the higher grades. Learning word meaning and improving reading comprehension cannot happen solely through the isolation of skills or only in a reading class. It, it's a cross-curricular activity. My experience has been that deliberately embedding word analysis and vocabulary skills in all areas of the curriculum will lead to higher levels of reading comprehension for students. And it really is, like the title of this report says, much more than just words on the page. Thank you, Brent. Our next speaker today is Francie Alexander. Francie works across the education and consumer divisions of Scholastic Incorporated, advising on the creation of educational products and services. She also oversees the Scholastic Education Research and Evaluation Team. A leader in education research policy, Ms. Alexander has held key positions in state and federal education agencies, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Education. She is also a former member of the National Assessment Governing Board. Francie, we look forward to hearing your insights. Thank you, Cornelia. It's been a privilege to participate in this process from the very beginning. As Cornelia said, I was involved in the development of the framework for the assessment, and as a member of NAGBI, I had the opportunity to review many items like the ones the commissioners showed us. Throughout the framework process, I was convinced of two things. First, as vocabulary is a critical part of reading comprehension, it needed to be given more emphasis. And second, NAEP should issue a separate report on vocabulary to highlight its importance and to provide this kind of clear information on the vocabulary knowledge of our students that we've seen in the results reported. So now we can have the kind of discussion we're engaged in. The changes in the framework reflect an extensive body of research conducted over decades, demonstrating that vocabulary is predictive of reading achievement. The framework development process was also influenced by the research on meaningful differences in vocabulary knowledge the result from differences in experiences and exposure to language, like those that Brent described, some of these that occur before children even come to school, and the importance of vocabulary for lower income, English language learners, struggling readers, and other students who are in our schools now. Not surprisingly, the NAEP results for vocabulary follow the same pattern as the results of the main NAEP as the main NAEP is an assessment of reading comprehension. So students who do well in one do well in the other and vice versa. Those students with a smaller vocabulary score lower in reading comprehension. And so the assessment was designed to exploit this link between vocabulary and comprehension, requiring students to know the meaning of the words in passages they read in order to gain understanding. So simply said, the meaning isn't obvious. The meaning comes from the context. Think about a simple word like about. So I could say, if I'm making an estimate, it's about time. Or I could say, I'm going to be out and about today. Or I could say, I'm going to be reading about vocabulary development. And if my teenager gets home too late, I could say something like, it's about time. And that doesn't have any of the previous meanings. That con connotes a lot more. So this assessment seemed to anticipate the common core and other rigorous standards that was shifting from a focus on just learning individual words, but to be able to study words in context, to understand their nuances, the pragmatics of language usage, and recognizing families of words. Many of us may have admonished our children at home or at school to use your words. Can you hear yourself saying that? If students are going to meet higher standards for college and career readiness, 
by reading more complex text and writing analytically, the vocabulary learning task is enormous. There are hundreds of thousands of words in contemporary usage, including academic words and words from the domains of mathematics, science, health, social studies, and the arts. Brent gave us a list of some of those from mathematics. So this means that students in our schools will need to learn 65,000 to 75,000 words during their school years. And this is in contrast to the only 10,000 words that we use in our everyday speech. Well, there are almost no changes from 2009 to 2011. It is my hope that standards like the ones for the Common Core, once they become implemented, will provide more opportunities, again, like those that Jack described for his school for vocabulary learning. And I guess it's Brent who described those um, in, in his school. Um, and that this will lead to voluminous reading, direct instruction of critical words, and more word-solving strategies. I think we do a good job with introducing kids to phonemes, the sounds of language, graphemes, their written representation. I think we need to look more at those little units of meaning, the morphemes, and that then we'll see an improvement in student performance in both vocabulary and reading. And toward that end, NAEP will continue to provide its independent assessment to see that children have the words they need to succeed in school and in life. Thanks to everybody who's participating in this release. Thank you, Francie. Our final speaker, Dr. Margaret McCowan, is a senior scientist at the University of Pittsburgh's Learning Research and Development Center and clinical professor in the School of Education there. Her research has focused on the, effort, uh, the effects of vocabulary knowledge on reading comprehension, the examination of students' knowledge as developed from textbooks, and the development of instructional approaches to help students construct meaning from text. Her work has been published extensively in outlets for both research and practitioner audiences, and she has received honors from the International Reading Association and the National Academy of Education, among many others. She has served as a vice president for a division of the American Educational Research Association and editor of the American Educational Research Journal. Dr. McCowan served on the NAEP Reading Framework Planning Committee and was instrumental in developing the vocabulary portion of the framework. She also has been involved in reviewing passages and test questions for the NAEP Reading Assessment. Margaret, we're happy you're here with us today to share what research tells us about vocabulary and reading. Thanks, Cornelia. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to uh, talk about the report. As Cornelia mentioned, I've been involved with NAEP since 2003 as a member of the Framework Planning Committee, which was charged with developing recommendations for this current reading framework. Uh, and as Frenzy described, uh, that included creating a vocabulary assessment within the larger reading assessment. The chief motivation for that was recognizing the role that vocabulary knowledge plays in reading comprehension and wanting to get a better picture of that. Francie described the predictive relationship between vocabulary and reading comprehension, and some specific results within that domain have demonstrated that vocabulary knowledge of primary grade students can predict their high school reading comprehension. We've also learned that instruction in vocabulary can boost reading comprehension, and Brent spoke to that. Um, but research findings clearly show that shallow knowledge of words, such as memorizing definitions, is not likely to affect reading comprehension. The kind of word knowledge that does help comprehension requires lots of encounters with the word in a variety of contexts. So with that kind of thinking about vocabulary as our foundation, the NAEP uh, vocabulary assessment was designed to be deliberately distinct from traditional vocabulary assessments in three ways. It's not based on a list of specific words, and that's because there is no set of specific words that students must know. Rather, there are types of words that are important to literacy. These are words that occur frequently in text across content areas, often referred to as academic words or tier two words. And a problem with building tests around sets of specific words is that it can encourage teaching students that limited set which often results in shallow and rote knowledge. Second, the target words on the NAEP assessment appear within the context of a passage rather than in isolation, 
as is the case with almost all, virtually all other vocabulary tests. And third, the NAEP items emphasize understanding how a word is used within a context rather than the definition, and that's, that's been mentioned. But this decision represents the major rationale for the assessment, uh, the, the way it being the way it is, because it involves the kind of knowledge that students need to have about words in order to understand what they read. During reading, readers need to integrate meanings of individual words into the context. This requires flexible knowledge of words so you can adjust to nuances of word meaning across different contexts. When readers successfully integrate words into context, they can build more precise understanding. For example, understanding that deducing rules from examples has a particular meaning that's distinct from simply remembering rules or knowing rules. Uh, Francie pointed out the relationship between the um, NAEP uh, vocabulary assessment, the, the way we assess vocabulary, and the Common Core Standards. And I just want to highlight one example from the Common Core Standards, this, the one that asks students to interpret words and phrases as they are used in a text and analyze how specific word choices shape meaning or tone. And that very much reflects what we're, what we're about with the NAEP vocabulary assessment. Uh, so to the results of the assessment, the initial administrations indicate, first of all, a consistent relationship between comprehension and vocabulary. But the results also give us a snapshot of how young readers deal with vocabulary in their reading. Readers seem to be reasonably successful at understanding portions of a text based on knowledge of individual keywords. Further, the results suggest what readers who have less developed vocabulary might be doing in dealing with unfamiliar words in text. As the examples in the report show, these readers often select responses that do conform to the gist of the overall passage. And that's a good thing, because it suggests that these readers are striving to fit ideas together to make sense of the text as they read. But it also may suggest a lack of precision in their understanding. For example, in the Mint Snowball passage, the example that um, Jack Buckley mentioned about how mint syrup permeated the shaved ice. Many students who got the item wrong chose the option, made the shaved ice taste better. Now, that idea is consistent with the message of the passage overall, but it misses the precise idea that the flavor was created because the syrup spread throughout the ice. We're still in the early stages of assessing vocabulary and name, but these initial results may give us some clues about patterns to look for and how vocabulary fits into reading comprehension. High-performing fourth and eighth graders had lower vocabulary scores in 2011 compared to 2009, while in reading comprehension, they did as well or better than 2009. And so the reason might represent the kind of discrepancy that can occur between vocabulary and comprehension scores. Comprehension is a complex process. So for example, a high comprehension score for a passage doesn't necessarily mean that a reader understood all parts of that passage equally. There could be a key turning point or a relationship that might not have been understood, possibly because of a specific word within that portion of text. And so looking into the NAEP results can help us track down those things and, and, um, and get a better look at them. Um, so to wrap up, I look for future NAEP reports in vocabulary to provide invaluable data and trends on vocabulary in text. These data might help us get a better grasp on the nature of comprehending text and on the role of vocabulary knowledge in the quality of comprehension. Just as vocabulary is key to reading comprehension, NAEP can be key to showing us how the nation's students understand words they'll encounter and use every day. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Now we will respond to attendee questions during a brief online question and answer session. Our facilitator for this segment is Valerie Maripodi, and she will direct the questions to the appropriate speaker. Valerie. Thank you so much, Cornelia. For those of you who have questions about today's report card results or our speaker's comments, please submit them now. As Gerald mentioned, we ask that you direct your questions to all panelists, available from your drop-down menu of panelists in the Q&A panel. Also, please remember to include your name and organization when typing in your question. If we are not able to respond to your question during the event today, please know that we will respond via email. Our first question is from Michael Ward. 
He is inquiring as to whether, can you find, can you remind participants of the reason that 12th graders did not participate in the 2011 assessment? Jack, could you start us off? Uh, sure. Well, Michael, the, the reason is that uh, while NAEP, uh, reading and mathematics are mandatory uh, for states at the fourth and eighth grade level every two years uh, as part of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, uh, it's voluntary uh, for 12th grade uh, uh, students, and so we actually work with states, uh, as I mentioned briefly, uh, to, to try and encourage participation, but also we only do it every four years. And so we will be, uh, you know, we skip every other assessment. We will be assessing uh, 12th graders actually uh, again starting this January in 2013, uh, and in this case we actually have 13 states signed up to participate. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. Our next question is from Tammy Brodus. She is with Girls, Inc. Based on the NAEP findings within the different demographics, gender, race, socioeconomic status, what is being done about the impact standardized testing has on kids that do not have vocabulary and reading comprehension levels as high as their counterparts in more ideal circumstances? Francie, would you like to address this question? Yes, and I, and I, and I think um, the question is getting at in some test preparation for standardized tests, may be looking at words more in isolation than in the way that this NAEP assessment looked at words in context as, as we've discussed. So I, th I think that that's an, an important question in, in terms of, of the different types of assessment and why I believe that this NAEP assessment in particular can help look at how to implement things like the Common Core Standards and advance an agenda for, I think, really high quality and research-based instruction. I, I think that some of the things that um, come to mind from the research that we can do to close those gaps that um, appeared in the assessment are, I think we have to look at quantitatively and qualitatively. I think since there's so many words of importance for students to learn, that we need to extend the time for learning and we need to start this kind of instruction early. I believe that it needs to start, um, kids need by being read to in pre-kindergarten, lots of opportunities for um, listening to high quality text throughout the primary grades and indeed from kindergarten through 12 are part of the wide exposure that's needed. I think students also, since you know words are the currency of the classroom, need to do some of the kinds of things that are being implemented in Brent School and taking advantage of summer learning and many opportunities. And so I think the, the very quantity and exposure has to be increased. And then qualitatively, I think we need to look at some of the things I mentioned briefly. I think as we look at Common Core Standards and the call for reading more complex text, both literary text and nonfiction or informational text, that students need to in, um, be engaged deeply in deep reading of whole text. And again, when they're not ready to, lead, to, to read on their own more complex text, to be read to. Um, I think in addition to that, there has to be the kind of direct instruction as we like on the multiple meanings, like on cognates, words that are the same from perhaps Spanish to English, different ways to help add to uh, the word bank that um, children can draw from when they're trying to extract meaning from text. And then I think we need to do, um, I mentioned morphology, we need to help students with word solving strategies and, and put more focus on this is a well-researched area. Let's teach more about things like prefixes and suffixes and root words so again, students can greatly increase their repertoire of words and have the kind of robust vocabulary it's going to take to do well in school and to meet common core standards. Great, thank you so much, Francie. Our next question is from Susan Thomas. She is inquiring what intentional vocabulary instruction can be done in grades K through three to boost vocabulary knowledge by grade four? And specifically, what word lists are most relevant for those students in K through 12 so their vocabulary is developed appropriately by grade four? Margaret, would you like to address this question? Sure. I'll take a stab at it. Um, but first, I'd say um, try not to think in terms of word lists, because that's where we often get ourselves in trouble. Uh, words selected from what students are reading, and uh, in, in the early grades, K to 3, the, the good books that we're reading to kids, the read-alouds, because 
even at that early level, we want to um, teach kids the meanings of words that uh, they're going to be meeting in text because the, the conversational words, the, the words we use every day, kids are going to learn those on their own pretty well. Now, and the importance is, of course, teaching kids to read those words, but as far as the meanings, they don't, they don't need much instruction. So I say look to the more sophisticated books that you'll be reading to those students. And the main things are to um, directly explain the meanings of the words to children, but also get them involved with, with uh, using those words and um, embedding into their own lives. You know, how can they use those words to, to describe things that they do and see every day and get them to use a lot of language around those, those words. Those are the types of activities that are most important. Excellent, thank you. We have a lot of questions today on English language learners. And a question from Maria Shahian. She is asking, were English language learners and students with disabilities part of the NAEP? And if so, were the score differences, what were the score differences for these populations? Jack, could you address this question? Absolutely. Uh, so yes, uh, English language learners and students uh, with disabilities were part of, of all of these samples. Uh, and I can uh, quickly address some of the score differences that we observed. Uh, so for example, at the fourth grade level, uh, the average uh, score uh, for in uh, 2011 uh, for vocabulary for English language learners was 182 uh, compared to for non-ELL uh, students actually uh, had an average of 222. And a similar comparison between students with disabilities uh, in grade four at 2011 on average uh, scored at 185, while those uh, students not with disabilities scored an average of 222. Uh, turning you know, again quickly to uh, eighth grade, English language learners scored on average at 219 in 2011, but uh, non-English language learner students actually scored at 268. So all of these types of comparisons are actually available in the report, uh, so I won't read them all out, uh, but they are in the appendix tables. So if you uh, go online and grab the report, they start on page 22, and so page 22, 23, and they go on from there uh, to, to present a lot of other comparisons that we didn't have time to discuss in the presentation earlier. Excellent. Thank you so much. Our next question is from Lauren Fitzpatrick from the Chicago Sun-Times. Sun she is asking, which comes first? And this is a question that I'm seeing a lot in the Q&A today. Vocabulary or reading comprehension? What should teachers be teaching? Brent, would you like to start us off with that question? That's a very good question, and that's a question that, um, that we tried to attack in the, uh, I mentioned earlier I was a, uh, had a principalship at a pre-K through eight school, and that's the exact conversation we had as a staff when we looked at poor reading scores and tried to find out what can we do for reading comprehension to, to fix that. And, and our decision was to attack vocabulary. Um, so uh, I saw good results with that, um, was attacking the vocabulary skills, making sure that they knew how to break words. Um, my kids there didn't even know uh, what a root word was, so trying to talk to them about adding inflected endings or suffixes and prefixes to words was very um, new to them, but once once we did that, then they could then they could make better sense out of what they read. Um, but it goes back to things that both Margaret and Francie have have already mentioned about making sure that you you spend time giving um, a detailed account of what what words can mean. I, I mean the same. Francie's example of the word about earlier in her presentation was excellent because we we take for granted what we're saying to kids all the time. And that, I'll, I'll visit with kids in the hallway, just say something like, hey, man, you need to toe the line. Well, they don't know what I'm talking about, you know, toe the line. So I have to, I have to back up and say, all right, you need to do the right thing. I know they know what that means. They need to do the right thing. But all of that... I mean, that's a great question, which comes first, comprehension or vocabulary? I, I believe a heavy emphasis on vocabulary directly influenced the, the increased reading comprehension scores that I, that I had at my school. So I would lean toward vocabulary, especially with our early kids. Can I jump in there? Oh, this is Margaret on, on that question, too. 
Um, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Boy, if we knew the answer to that, you know, we could all go home. Um, but we do know that vocabulary, influ good vocabulary influences comprehension, and reading comprehension influ influences vocabulary. It is an interlocking relationship. As far as what teachers should be teaching, I think, you know, Brent has given some, some clues there that vocabulary may be, because it's, it's somehow a little narrower than reading comprehension overall, it may be a good place to, to start. That it's something more direct that you can um, go for. But I'm also hoping that maybe in, with future NAEP uh, administrations, as we go forward and have more of a body of those, that we may be able to learn, uh, might vocabulary be a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? Excellent. Thank you so much. We have a very technical question that I think only Dr. Buckley could answer. Uh, he, our participant today, David Pearson, is wondering, um, uh, did you conduct, conduct any sorts of factor analysis or cluster analysis to determine whether the vocabulary scores are statistically independent of the comprehension scores? Jack? Hi, David. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, so uh, we did not yet conduct a, any factor analysis or cluster analysis, but we have looked uh, at some simple correlations uh, between the vocabulary scores and the overall uh, reading comprehension scores. And so, for example, uh, in 2011 at grade four, they, the scores correlated at about 0.72, and I think at, uh, at eighth grade they're about 0.76, and we see something similar in other years uh, and certainly across the grades which we'd expect, uh, certainly some fairly high degree of correlation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Our, our next question is uh, from Laurie Hansen. She is wondering, what do you see as the role of independent reading in children's vocabulary development, especially English learners? Margaret, would you like to take a stab at that first? Um, sure. I'll start. Uh, independent reading is, is a, a a huge plays a huge role in increasing vocabulary. The problem is that the kids who are most in need of vocabulary enhancement and, and reading development are not the ones who are reading on their own because it, it's difficult and it's painful for them to read. And often if they do read, what they're reading isn't giving them a lot of new vocabulary words because they're, they're reading at such an easy level. So while it is a really important um, aspect, um, we have to find ways to get these kids into reading by, um, you know, reading reading to them and giving them um, maybe smaller things to read and helping and and really giving them some scaffolding and helping them out. And I have a feeling that Francie can speak to that also because she is the book person. Thanks, Maddie. And um, I. I do believe that kids need a lot of exposure to text, and, and I think you gave a good example of one way to do it. And for the research is clear that it isn't about to kids who are in upper elementary that they really can um, comprehend as everything they can read. So I think it's so important to always have a read aloud along with an independent reading program so that you're able to provide some models, you're able to stretch kids in terms of their exposure to the types of vocabulary that we talked about today. And then when kids are reading independently, I think there are some conditions that can, can get at the issues that Mari got at to make it worthwhile for kids. Some people call it tough love independent reading. And that means is really giving them a lot of assistance in the selection process, helping them to, again, go for books sometimes that will stretch their reading ability. Also, conferencing with kids before, during, and after the independent reading so they know they're going to have some responsibility for discussion. Um, in the new common standards, helping kids to learn to be, while they're reading, being able to answer questions using specific evidence from the text that they're reading so that they'll be more focused. And so sort of the tough left reading that I did, and I've taught from kindergarten to college, um, I would have all students read alone together. So during their independent reading time, while they were reading quietly to themselves, I would come in and pop in at any time and ask them to read out loud to me from what they were reading so I would know that they were on task, I would know that they were focused, so that they would get the benefits from independent reading. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. We have another question about the scores today from Jerome Dancis. Jack, could you uh, answer this question? What is the significance between NAEP scores of, say, 270 and 260? Could you expand on that? Uh, sure. It's a, it's a great question. So, so to begin with, of course, it depends at, on uh, what grade uh, level you're talking about. So just uh, let me pick uh, grade 12, uh, for example. You know, I, I showed in the presentation uh, probably the way that, that we use, uh, at least here internally, to make the most sense of these uh, results in terms of what do these numbers actually mean are those item maps. And so if you think back to the grade 12 item map, which I'm sure everyone memorized when we flashed it up there, uh, a, a score of 271 was right around, uh, corresponded to being likely to uh, be able to interpret or understand the meaning of the word in context, either proactive or self-possessed. Uh, but when you fell below that, you know, we, we would uh, argue from the data that students uh, would not be likely to understand those words. So when you look at a, a large enough item map and, and actually looking at the various words, uh, I think the best way to understand the scores uh, is sort of how well uh, given students, you know, with an, a particular score actually are able to comprehend words uh, of varying difficulty, which is really, of course, the, the entire purpose of the assessment. Now, moving away from, from that sort of interpretation, the other uh, place where we find the scale scores to be useful, of course, is looking at things like gaps and trends. So I can see you know, how far apart in scale score might be, may uh, two subgroups like English language learners and, and non-English language learners be. And then you can map that back to the types of words that the various types of students are likely to know. And of course, we also find that the uh, scale scores are, are very useful to look at uh, to see trends over time. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions coming in today about uh, actionable tools that you can implement, especially for tutors. A question specifically from Ronjanette Taylor from America Reads in Mississippi. With the results of this study, how should a tutoring program prepare tutors to better work with students on vocabulary and reading comprehension? And what tools are out there to develop those plans and training? Francie, could you go ahead and start us off? Sure. Um, and as I mentioned, I've taught from kindergarten to college, and I so appreciated the support that my students got from tutors and mentors. So thank you out there in Mississippi for what you're doing. I think it's a critical part of the education equation. Here are some of the things that worked for me. Um, the best training was to meet with the teacher. And so I met with all of the tutors who were going to be working with my students before. And I even had them come in and watch me do a read aloud mm -hmm. and watch me do a reading lesson just to get a sense of some of the things that I had learned um, in, in my teaching preparation. Some t training programs also ha do have their own training. And of course, if you're going to tutor, avail, avail yourself of that. Um, another thing that I use just now to focus in on the vocabulary, something that I use uh, because I still do some um, tutoring myself now, is something called word sift. It's one word, and it's word S-I-F-T. And it's a free um, application, something that was developed out of Stanford. You can take the text that the child is going to be reading, look at it, and they'll highlight what are the vocabulary words in it that, just like we talked about today, that within the context are important for kids to understand the text. So in terms of preparing yourself, and if you're thinking a lot about the vocabulary and what you can do, there's a tool that's at the ready. Another thing that I, I um, want to just remind everybody who is tutoring or who may, may tutor is I had just heard the distinguished math educator, Marilyn Burns, speak, and she tested children on mathematics in one-to-one -one situation and learned so much about their reasoning by the conversation. She said also in working with the children, the one-on-one -on -one attention meant so much to them. So when you're together, the simple conversation, and this part doesn't take a lot of training, but just the conversation, the just asking them to summarize or tell you about what they've read so that you can get a sense of, well, are they in one of our words from, from our presentations today? Are they puzzled? And, and also using sometimes in your own vocabulary and modeling words that might be beyond the text that they're able to read. So that one-on-one -on -one time is really important. Another technique that works is sometimes kids in tutoring situations feel like they're on the spot. 
it's like they're doing all the work and maybe they feel the tutor is just listening to them read. Well, they don't have to be the only one reading. So as a tutor, try some things like with young kids, you read a sentence and then the child reads the same sentence right after because they're just beginning, like echo reading. When kids get older, do sh share the reading load and because a reading role model is really important to a child. So you can read a page or a paragraph and then the child can do the same. So um, I think these are some techniques, and I think also in terms of the reading time um, together, one thing that I did with students I tutored is said, bring in something you really wish you were able to read, and that would motivate them to work harder because it is hard work, especially for students who are struggling. So maybe you would get the manual that kids had to read to prove a driver's test, and then we would take the last five minutes to see how much better that my student was getting at reading because of all the work we were putting in in our tutoring sessions. So I hope some of those things work for you. Excellent. Thank you so much. The next question I have is from Amanda Avalone. She is wondering, although it's not the purpose of NAEP to address instructional practice or curriculum directly, were you able to discover anything noteworthy regarding the current state of vocabulary instruction via the background non-cognitive assessment questions. Jack, could you provide some insight into that question? Uh, sure, that's a great question. So there's an awful lot in the, in the background uh, questions or, or non-cognitive questions, and you know, we've only started to, to begin uh, to, to really dig into them, and that's, of course, why we make tools like the NAEP Data Explorer available online uh, to make it easier for the, for the research community and, and those just generally interested to do the same. I can share with you just a couple quick examples of some things that we've, we've looked at. And so uh, one thing we do ask uh, students' teachers, uh, for example, in the fourth grade, uh, we ask them about different uh, levels of emphasis that they may place on different parts of, of reading instruction. Uh, so one uh, question we ask is, uh, how much emphasis do you place on uh, critique or evaluation when reading text? And it's a categorical response that we record the teacher's answer compared not at all versus a small extent, a, a moderate extent, or a large extent. And if you look just to take, again, one example, in 2011 for fourth graders, uh, the average score for teachers, uh, for the students of teachers who said that they really use, you know, place no emphasis on critique and evaluation uh, when, when teaching text was 210. Uh, and, and essentially, statistically significantly, it just goes up as they place more uh, emphasis. So we found a score of 217 was on average associated with uh, uh, teachers who, who uh, put a small extent of emphasis on critique and evaluation, all the way up to an average scale score of 221 uh, for teachers who reported uh, a large extent of their uh, emphasis was critique and evaluation. Now, as always, you know, I have to, to caveat that by saying, that, you know, data, cross-sectional data of this sort, uh, as we report in NAEP, is quite good at giving us uh, accurate and valid descriptive statistics, but it's not going to show causality, and you would need to do a uh, much more careful research design before you concluded that, that something like this uh, was causing an increase in, in students' vocabulary scores. But the background questions do provide a very rich uh, uh, sort of place to, to look for, uh, uh, to generate hypotheses about what might be working or to, to uh, confirm things that we may already know from experiment, uh, how prevalent they are in, in the education system. Um, I'd just like to add um, uh, greetings to Amanda, who's been involved in, in this process, too. And with the caveat from the commissioner in mind, I do, though, find these, um, these parts of the reports kind of a treasure trove of information and, and ideas for future study. And NAEP also most recently released the results of the first time the writing assessment was administered um, using technology. And in the background data, I was interested to find that students who had the option of using an online thesaurus tool to enhance or improve um, their writing, that the ones who used it more frequently had a higher on average score. So I see another link there between this whole um, idea of having a robust vocabulary to improve both reading and writing. And if you're using a thesaurus, that does say to me that you are looking for nuances and, and improving uh, the context. And something, um, I mentioned word sift and, and just the idea of technology in this larger conversation I think is important as students have more 
access to technology, I think that we're going to want to be looking at what are the aspects of technology that don't distract students from learning, but that indeed enhance and improve educational outcomes and learning. Great. Thank you so much. That is all the time that we have questions for today. We will follow up with you through email for those that we weren't able to address during this time. Cornelia, go ahead. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Valerie. And thanks to all of you who submitted questions, and we will get back to you with the responses, as Valerie said. I think you'll agree that we've learned today about more than words. But please don't let the end of the webinar today be all that you learn about the NAEP vocabulary results. There's much more information that can be found on our website. Not only will you find today's reports, but you'll also find the speaker's comments, the reading framework on which the assessment is based, and you'll find the 2009 and the 2011 reading report cards. As was mentioned earlier, you can also gain access to the NAEP Data Explorer, where you'll be able to um, find out details. You'll, in a few days, we'll be able to post an archived version of today's webinar. And um, we hope that you can uh, continue exploring and following us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, both NCES and the Governing Board are there, and you can find alerts about upcoming assessments. Before we close today, I want to especially thank Jack, Brent, Francie, and Margaret for sharing their insights and the information they shared today. And of course, we want to thank all of you for participate, participating today. Goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect your lines. Thank you, and have a great day.